All right, so can you all see that screen? Yep, okay, cool. It's always a little nerve wracking. You're like, what if I share the wrong screen? Um, but here we are. We are in the beginning of week three. Um, and so a couple announcements to just kind of get us started. Um, we have that math and writing assignment number two was due yesterday by midnight. Um, so I just went through WebAssign and um, also read a few of those papers that people submitted. Um, so take a look at your grades. Let me know if you have any questions on that. Um, so this week on Monday, which is today, we're going to cover 6.3 as well as parent function graph transformations. So those of you who were in Math 116 with me, um, this is going to be more of a review um, in sort of a Desmos kind of way uh, to help us remember some of those things that we know about graph transformations. Um, and if you were not with us in Math 116, then I hope that this little bit of review will kind of set the stage for what we're going to learn on Wednesday, okay? On Wednesday, we're going to start 6.1, um, which is graphs of sine and cosine and all the transformations that we can do with them. Um, Quiz five is due on Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. Quiz six is due on Friday at 9.30 a.m. So those regular due dates should be part of that scheduler or whatever you have to keep track of your work, right? So Wednesdays and Friday mornings. And then the other deadline we wanna make sure we get in there is that math and writing assignment that's due by midnight. And so every week you have the option of doing web assign, which it looks like a lot of you took up this week. Um, you also have the option of um, writing about a different topic that you wanted to do a little bit more research on. Um, some of the topics I picked were ones that I thought might be interesting because they tied into trigonometry, but you're welcome to bridge out or look outside of those topics and kind of see other things that might potentially interest you, okay? Um, all right, so exam one. I have gotten everyone's exam one and I will be working on grading those today and tomorrow. Okay, so we should have grades posted by the middle of this week. Um, after grades are released, I'm happy to go over any of the questions with you that you'd like to sort of get clarification around, All right? Um, and the last announcement is just don't forget all the support that you have. Um, I feel like even though we're only in week three, a lot of us have been going since August and this is the time in the semester when things get like really hard and, and you just feel like kind of stressed out about all the things and all your classes are having midterms. And so I know it can be a really tough time of the semester, um, which is a great time to reach out to other resources that maybe make that um, time a little bit more efficient for you, okay? Um, all right, are there any questions on the announcements for this morning? Um, so two things then before we sort of move away from Canvas. Um, if you go into the assignments, and I'm not in the student view right now, so yours might look a little bit different. But if you look into the assignments, um, one thing that I did update was the math and writing assignments. Um, so I, initially, I only had like two or three of them up, um, but I posted a bunch of the other ones, um, I think. So I'm going to go back and just make sure that's all finished. So if anybody feels like they want to work ahead, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, there is one assignment in particular that I want to kind of bring up, which is under math and writing assignment number seven. Okay. So math and writing assignment number seven, if we take a look at that one. Um, this one, the first, you have your options of doing the web assign or designing your own math and writing assignment. But the first option um, is actually something about polar art and using Desmos to create some really cool looking things. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know ahead of time that if you choose this option for the assignment number seven, it actually is going to count for assignment seven and assignment eight. 
okay? So kind of think about this um, as you get closer to the end of the semester, that if you're like feeling really burned out, especially a lot of us who've been going since August, like this is a really intense um, course. And so um, there is this option to take a look at some playing around in Desmos and making some pretty things. And um, that is a perfectly fine way to kind of finish off the last two math and writing assignments, okay? Um, take a look at that. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'm happy to help you out with Desmos um, and a lot of stuff is definitely Googleable out there in terms of like how do you make really cool things on Desmos, okay? Um, are there any questions about the math and writing assignments? All right, so I have one last, last question for you. And that is, for those of you who are planning to move uh, with the cohort to Math 150 in the spring, right? So the goal here of STEM Core is um, not only do we have sort of a, a cohort-based model where we're all sort of, sort of working together and you have this piece of consistency, um, but it also extends into the spring when we're going to be hopefully all taking Calc 1 together. OK, um, so for those of you who are thinking about moving on in that direction, um, I just wanted to kind of take a poll. Was it helpful to have web assigned? Like, is that a piece of the class that you still want to keep? Okay. Okay. So is the kind of, um, okay. So I, I see one kind of, which is, or two kind of is like, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Do you like having the choice to not do the web assign when you don't want to? Is that part of it? Which is totally fine. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought yours might be. Um, and then, Ethan, can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by the way it was in Math 116? Um, I feel okay. like the show your work thing complicated it way too much. It just became so cumbersome. And I just, like this week, I just ended up doing the written assignment just because mm -hmm. web assignment was, you know, um, cumbersome to like export each file individually and upload it and some questions it's like just for you and it's just like there's no work to show okay. but we still need the work credit for it so we have to jumble something together okay. and then uh yeah that's it okay um would it be helpful if maybe we looked into like if you're gonna do the web assign that you just send me a separate file with your work would that be a valuable yeah, I think it's something that uh, some of us also brought up in the Discord as well. If we could submit it in one file, it would help a lot more. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think, um, like I said, this is the first time I've done sort of the like ask you to show your work thing. And so I didn't really know how the platform was going to go, but I'm happy to sort of modify that as we go. Okay. So it sounds like then overall, it's a nice feature to have web assign as sort of an option um, that we can have. So let me speak with the STEM core team and let's see what the funding looks like for the spring um, because I think, you know, I would love to have that, that cost covered for you. I wanna try and keep this as low cost as possible for everyone. Okay, so web assign and then look into changing how you submit your work. Yeah, uh, I know the the typing in your math. I feel like I do it so much now that I'm like, oh, this is so cool. But it's it definitely takes a lot to figure out how to do that. So okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. All of that feedback really helps. Um, I did see something about Calc 2. I don't know what the summer schedule is like yet. Um, I hope I get to do Calc 2 again. That's what happened last year is with the STEM core team we did um, our fall classes and we had Calc 1 in the spring and then I also taught Calc 2 in the summer um, and so we were able to just crank out like four math classes in one year um, and so a lot of those folks are done with their requirements um, or they are well ahead of the game uh, in terms of you know getting those STEM credits out of the way because I know that can be a lot so um, 
It kind of depends. So every year, like every semester, we get to sort of throw our name in the hat for, or throw our name in the ring for what we want to teach. Um, but, you know, we definitely are encountering some budget cuts. So, you know, here's to hoping. I'm not going to complain too much as long as I get to teach a class, period. So, but, um, but hopefully one day I'll get to teach Calc 3. I do like it. I think that it's very, very visual and um, so here at Mesa, we have three calculus classes, Calc 1, Calc 2, and Calc 3. Uh, but some of the four-year schools that you may be looking to transfer to sometimes have a fourth calculus. So that's something that if you're looking to um, transfer, that you might want to start thinking about where you're thinking about transferring and what classes they need. So for example, if any of you out there are bio majors, you're thinking about transferring to a four year as a bio major, it depends on where you transfer, how many calculus classes you take. So if you're transferring to SDSU, I think state only requires Calc 1, which means that by the end of this year, you would be done with your math requirements. However, if you're thinking like a big UC, like UCLA, UCSD for a transfer and a bio major, they do require that you have Calc 2 as well. And so that sort of takes some students by surprise because they're like, I thought bio was the same everywhere. So you really got to think about where you might want to transfer and which classes you actually have to take. OK. Um, yeah, so Calc 3 is like derivatives and integrals in 3D. Um, but sometimes they do vector calculus as a second class, which would be technically Calc 4. Yeah, it is really neat on my end to kind of like follow students and see how much they grow because sometimes it doesn't feel like you're growing or getting better. But then all of a sudden, like you're able to just like crush a course and just be so, so strong in it when you never thought you could get there. And that's pretty cool. All right. So that being said, I'm going to stop sharing this for a moment. And um, OK, here's what I'm going to do. In Canvas, um, one of the assignments, there's actually an assignment under classwork now. So if you check in Canvas, there is one classwork assignment and it's called Marble Slides. So this is classwork number one is parent function marble. So this link the, that I'm about to show you is the link that is on that page in Desmos, okay? I mean, in Canvas. And so what we're gonna do is, I'm just gonna kind of take 10 minutes. I'm gonna show you on the screen. We're gonna kind of play around with things just so you get the idea of what the activity is supposed to be. Um, it's meant to be a more fun and engaging way to think about parent, uh, parent graphs and their graph transformations. Um, so, I look forward to getting your feedback on that and letting me know what you actually think about that, okay? So let me go ahead and share my screen again. All right, do you all see a Desmo screen? Yes, okay. So when you go to this activity, okay, um, I just wanna maybe talk about some of the the basic idea behind it. So it's kind of a game like situation where our goal is to take design a function. So all of the functions that we design are going to be in the red. Okay. And there's going to be this little purple dot, which is basically the marble. Okay. And that purple dot, we want to try and um, make it so that it collects all of the stars on any given page. Right. So for example, if I click launch here, So all these marbles come, they follow the function kind of like a slide and they catch all the stars. We good, right? Positive feedback. Everybody loves positive feedback, right? And so um, that's going to be your first slide. And then as you kind of move along, okay, so this, now we start to think about like how can we change numbers to make the marbles collect all the stars because right now if i collect if i hit launch the marbles just fall straight down and they in no way collect all the stars okay so let's take a look at the equation here of our blue line so y equals 4x plus 3 
Okay, so that's the graph of 4x plus 3. It's that line right there. Now, what might we want to change about that line so that we provide almost like a slide for the marbles to collect all the stars? All right, so change the coefficient of x, right? So we change that slope. Um, what can we change it to? Like one, okay, let's try one. So let's try one, right? And here's the beauty of this. You can just keep deleting numbers and inserting new numbers and just keep trying, okay? So there's a lot of guess and check here. So I typed in one, let's relaunch the marble. Still not collecting all the stars, okay? So Thea's other idea was one half. So maybe let's try one half, all right? So now we can see that line is actually, so a slope of one half, a less steep slope, if we launch the marbles now, should collect all the stars for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So that's sort of like one kind of game you have, right? And then um, you can always reset it um, if you want to do that. Yeah, a little bit in the sense that I, I want us to think about what we need to change, okay? Um, it should work on a phone. I believe this should be mobile uh, friendly, okay? So if we look at this one, right, um, one other type of thing that this is looking for is this blue line only goes until eight right now, right? So where did that number come from? This part right here in the squiggly brackets where it says X is less than eight, all that means is that that's where the line is gonna stop. The line is gonna stop at X is like just less than eight, okay? So if we wanted to change a number here, we could change this to like seven. Yeah, exactly. So it means it's like a line segment, okay? So like maybe X is less than seven, or I could just have it stop right at X is zero, right? But that one probably wouldn't work very well because all those marbles are just gonna fall right off the edge, right? So let's try seven here. Let's see, this should collect those first three. And then this one was kind of a little bit below the line. So like, let's see what happens if I put all the way to 12. That's not gonna catch that bottom star, right? So maybe let's go back and try seven and see if that catches that bottom star. But we could also try 10. Let's see what happens when we go all the way to 10. So I think that's what I thought the first time I did this too. I was like, oh yeah, that star's at 10, right? But then it just like, yeah, that last star is a little bit too low. So we need to think about where we stop our function so that we can get like the marbles that are sort of falling off the ramp to catch that last star. Okay. And let's see. All right. So maybe this will be, we'll do like a couple more together just to make sure we got the hang of it, okay? So with this one, we have our good old friend, the exponential function, right? We know that this is an exponential growth because it sort of starts flat and then it goes up pretty quickly. Um, but if we think about like this X minus 17, how do we, what does that minus 17 do? For those of us who were in math 116, what does that, minus 17 do? It moves it to the right 17, right? If I did plus 17, that would move it all the way to the left 17, right? So if I did like plus 10, it moves it to the right 10. So that one's not gonna work because it's gonna miss those two stars. So maybe let's try 19. Yeah, we bring it out a little bit more to get that whole curve there. And let's launch it and see what happens. It's very slow, I know. But it's also kind of gratifying. You have your little caterpillar of marbles. <laughs> and it, does, it should go very slow because that part of the function is pretty flat right? The further out you go in an exponential, it's very flat. Things aren't moving very quickly. 
Um, so Eric's question, how does the momentum work? What if the star is above where the ball starts? Okay. Well, maybe we need to think about, like, let's see a good one to play around with. Like something like this one. Like, how, how do we fix this exponential function, right? We have our three to the x plus one. But if I launch the marbles, it's only going to collect that first star. And, and then it goes all the way in the wrong direction, and they're going slowly. So we make the three negative. OK, let's try it. Oh, so when I have this negative three here, what graph transformation am I telling the function to do? This one, yeah, that negative sign in the front means a reflection. And this is something a lot of us kept confusing, but this minus in the front means it reflects over the x-axis. And so we get something kind of facing down. So I think we're on the right path in terms of a reflection, but we got to reflect the other way. We got to reflect over the y-axis, right? So let's, let's make this be negative, just like Christina said. Bingo, that's so perfect. Every single star gets matched right on there. Yay. Okay. Does this kind of make sense, like what we're doing here with the graph transformations? Okay. And if you were not in Math 116, it's okay to just kind of play around the numbers. But if you were not in 116, I would encourage you to kind of write down like what you think each number is doing, okay? Okay, let's, let's go over this one last type of question and then we'll kind of stop it here, okay? Um, how I made the marbles, oh, I found these marble things online that I cut and paste from a lot of different ones because they, <laughs> they, they were doing like all linear functions and all exponential functions. And I was like, well, let's just cram them all in there. But there is one also for trig functions. So we'll get a chance to play around with that as well. Yeah. Does the marble go up if the curve that goes up like a parabola? I think it should. I think it should. Okay. So um, one other kind of question that you're going to see is this prediction one. Okay. So we have this equation below. Y equals 2 x to the minus x minus 4 minus 3. And so the question here is if we change the minus 4 to a plus 4 in the equation, what would happen to the graph? Okay. So let's think about that. If I have a minus four instead of a plus four, yeah, we're not reflecting it. Yeah. I think if we have a plus four, we are going to shift the graph to the left instead of. Right. Okay. So like if I change this x plus 4, those of us who are in math 116 know that plus 4 moves everything to the left. Okay. But then what you'll get on the next slide is verify. So whatever you predicted, let's make that change and see if that's true. So I'm going to change this minus 4 to a plus 4. And it moved the graph four units to the left instead of four units to the right. Okay, so the dotted line, it was what was there originally. The solid line is the one that you made and it should match with your prediction, okay? Does this kind of make sense to folks? Any questions, any other questions about this activity? Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, but is everyone clear on where to find the link to this activity? Okay. If you're not clear, ask now. I'll tell you one more time. Okay, we are clear? Cool, cool. Okay. 
So this, uh, where, okay. So when you go into, uh, when you go into Canvas, okay, you're gonna go under classwork, and it should be classwork number one. That's one way to access it. The other way you can access it is you can go to Canvas, so you can go to assignment, you can go to classwork, and then classwork number one. All right, so um, what we're gonna do, oh, it should also show up under the dashboard. Thank you, thank you, yeah. Okay, so I think I set the deadline for this as deadline for, Right, so it's just going to be due by Tuesday, October 27th by 11.59 p.m. And the way you're going to submit it is when you sign in to Desmos, make sure to use your name that I know you by, or whatever that may be. And then I'll be able to go into the dashboard later and figure out like who did what, okay? All right, so that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into 6.3, okay? So I know this is out of order. You would think we'd start a new chapter, chapter six, and we'd start with 6.1, but we're actually gonna start with 6.3, okay? So we're gonna start with 6.3, um, and let me go ahead and share my screen for that. No, you don't have to have a Google or Desmos account. I think when you click on the link, it should take you directly to the student. Yeah, I think it just asks you for your name. That's it. Okay. I tried to make it easier so you didn't have to create a, an account. Um, but I think if you choose to do that Polar Art Project, you will have to create an account for Desmos. Okay, cool. All right. So... Let's, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's do this. Let's work for maybe about another 25 minutes and then we'll take a break um, and then go on from there. All right, so in 6.3, we're talking about something called inverse trig functions. And this is actually something that we already have seen in chapter five, which is kind of why I wanted to start with it in chapter six, okay? And so we're gonna take the time to fill in this chart a little bit, same chart that we've seen, um, but I really wanna make sure that we're all understanding how the different functions fit together, okay? So we know that we have the main trig functions, right? And so by now, this should be pretty familiar to us where we have sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, uh, but it also equals the y value on the unit circle, right? And so that second part was really the connection we wanted to make is that we've got opposite over hypotenuse, but it's also the y value on the unit circle. And if we follow this for all the main trig functions, we have cosine theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse, and that is the x value. And then tangent theta equals opposite over adjacent or y over x, okay? And the thing that I'm really looking for us to do, I think the sine and cosine, I think we should be able to find no problem from the unit circle, but I really want to make sure we're practicing that tangent piece so we really get that solid for ourselves, okay? 
Um, these were our main trig functions. And then we talked about our reciprocal trig functions. So the reciprocal of sine was cosecant. And so that made it hypotenuse over opposite or one over y, right? And then the reciprocal of cosine was secant theta, which was hypotenuse over adjacent, which was one over x, right? And then our last reciprocal function was cotangent of theta, and that was adjacent over opposite or x over y, right? So these were the functions that we started working with last week. And then um, sort of at the end of <clears throat> Monday's class, I think it was, we started looking at like, how do we find angles on the outside? Uh, how do we find the angles if we have the coordinate? And that's where these inverse functions came into play, okay? And so now we're gonna take a look at like, last week I was like, okay, here are two answers, I want you to write them both. But this week, I'm like, there are two answers, but I need you to write the right one. Okay, so now we're at the point where we're making the decision about which angle is the right answer. Okay? So the inverse sign, we had something like this, sign with a little minus one. Okay? <laughs> Scary because now one of them is right. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Okay, so sine of if we have opposite over hypotenuse is going to give us an angle, okay? And we could also do the same thing for cosine. Inverse cosine just has that little minus one. We have a coordinate. We get an angle out. And then our last inverse, tan uh, inverse function is inverse tangent. And that one is they give you the opposite over adjacent and they want you to find the angle that goes with that. Okay. And so everything that I've written here so far is what you are expected to know. Okay. We want to know these functions. We want to know so many things about these functions, like what the graphs look like, whether they're even or odd, the domain, the range, all that kind of stuff. OK, but I know some of you out there are super nerdy and we're like probably been asking, but what about the reciprocal trig functions? Do they have inverses as well? And it turns out that they do. We just don't really use them that much. So I'm going to write them out here in the last column in the blue. But this is not something that we will use in this class. I just kind of want you to know they exist. OK, so if I wanted to write inverse cosecant, how might I write that? Yeah, exactly. Cosecant with the minus one. And that means that they've given me the hypotenuse over the opposite. And my answer better be an angle. Okay, so that part's not different. It's exactly the same as the inverse main trig functions, but it's just for the other trig function. Okay. Now, if we follow that pattern, then we have the inverse secant and that would be hypotenuse over adjacent, would give us some angle. And last but not least, there is an inverse cotangent. That would be the adjacent over the opposite, and you would be expected to find an angle, okay? So this last one, not in our class, but I just want us to know that they exist, okay? Our focus should be everything that we wrote before. The sine cosine tangent, the cosecant secant cotangent, and the sine inverse cosine inverse and the tangent inverse, okay? Um, great question. When would we use the inverse reciprocal? You know, I can't think of a time really when it would be more useful than the inverse main trig function, okay? But I think sometimes when we don't talk about them, then we just assume they don't exist. I just want us to know they exist. Yeah, but I think most of the time you can use the inverse sine and cosine and tangent to deal with that instead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So I hope everyone has calculators and I hope your calculators are in a specific mode. I hope they're on degrees because that's what we're going to need to do examples one and two. Okay. So let's start with some applications of inverse trig functions. So one of the things that I think is so easy to sort of get away with is there's so much trig that's like very abstract, but in the reality is we actually can use this quite a bit in real life, okay? So let's take a look at example one. A person flying a kite has released 176 meters of string. That's a long, long, tail for that kite. But the string makes an angle of 27 degrees with the ground. And so I'd like us to find two things. How high is the kite, like vertically from the ground? And also how far away horizontally is that kite, okay? So let's go ahead and draw a diagram. And so we know that we have And we have our kite up here. Okay. Um, tell me where some of these numbers go. Where does the 176 go? Where does the 27 go? Because they're asking how high the kite is, we can assume it's like your, um, your Y, which is like up and down, and then how far away horizontally would probably be the ground, and therefore the 176 is your string, because um, it does say it's a string too. Yeah, exactly, and Ethan and Thea, you got it right, that 176 is our hypotenuse, good, okay. And so now we just need to think about where the 70, uh, 27 degrees goes, and now, in this problem, they say specifically that it's the angle with the ground, okay? So we should know that that's going to be this angle here and that theta would equal 27 degrees, okay? Now, another way they could have said this is the angle with the ground is they could have called it an angle of elevation. Okay, they could have called it an angle of elevation. It would have meant that you label that in the same place. Okay. So now that we've got this, we really have two problems nested in one. We're trying to find our X. We're trying to find our Y. All right. So let's see how we set that up. If I want to find X and if I want to find why I'm going to need different trig functions. So which function should I use to find x? Sine, cosine, or tangent? And tell me why. Mm -hmm. We're going to use cosine, right? So we know cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? And how might we know that? Well, we have the hypotenuse and we want to find the adjacent, right? So we fill in the numbers. We have cosine of 27 equals x over 176. Um, how do I get that x by itself? Exactly. We multiply that 176 to both sides. So we're going to get x equals 176 times cosine 27. And whoa, I ran out of room. And if we type that out on the calculator, 176 times cosine of 27, make sure you're in degrees, but you should get 156.817 meters, okay? Something like that. If you don't get that number, 
then that probably means that you're in radians. I think that's the number one mistake about why people don't get the number that matches, okay? Is that you're in radians by accident instead of being in degrees. All right, well, if we needed cosine to find x, then one of the other trig functions might be useful in finding y, right? So let's see what we have. y is opposite from theta, so maybe it would be good to use sine theta because I want the opposite side and I have the hypotenuse. Okay. And so if we work this out, we get sine of 27 equals y over 176. And so by a similar reasoning, we can say that y equals 176 times sine of 27. And when we type that into the calculator, it should give us 79.448 meters. Okay. I'll give you a moment to write that down. I didn't type it in that fast. I just had done it from earlier. Okay. So. Um. Well, I hope I typed it in correctly. Let me see. 176 times sine of 27. Oh my gosh, I don't know where I got that number from. <laughs> it should be what, 0 0.902? <laughs> Thank you. I have no idea how that happened, um, which, by the way, is a good moment to point out that if you feel like these things happen to you, which they clearly do to me, writing this step on a test or a quiz actually will get you more points because if you just give me an answer and I don't know what you typed into the calculator, then you could have typed the wrong thing in. But if you tell me exactly what you typed in and you happen to type it in wrong, that's like a half a point, right? So. All right, now, any questions so far on example number one? All right, so this should feel familiar, right? It should feel familiar from what we learned in the first chapter, in chapter five. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at example two Think about how to set it up. Some of that setup should feel familiar, and then we'll talk about how we can find um, our answer and how that second question is going to be a little bit different from the first question. So, example number two says that a five foot ladder leans against the wall, and the base of the ladder is two feet away from the wall. What is the angle between the ladder and the wall? Okay, so I'm going to start with a diagram. Okay, we hope that the angle between the wall and the ground is 90 degrees, right? I don't know about you, but I feel like sometimes, like my bookshelf. I think the floor in my room is not totally flat because sometimes the bookshelf feels like it's like leaning a little bit. But we hope in the real world that most things are 90 degrees if we need them to be. Um, how can we label this diagram with the information we have? Um, we know that the base of a ladder is basically the bottom mm -hmm. and it's, since it's a two feet away from the wall, we can assume it's like your x value. Yep. And the hypotenuse is five. Excellent, Gloria. Okay. Um, and where do we put our theta? Between the ladder and the wall. <laughs> Exactly. And I, I know that it says between the ladder and the wall, but I'm like intentionally pausing here because I think that is a place where people are like, 
is it that easy? And like, yeah, it is. If it tells you it's between the ladder and the wall, then we're just gonna label that angle, okay? I do want to point out before we go on though, that this angle is not the angle of depression, okay? So sometimes in questions we see like the angle of elevation and that's like what we saw in example one, but this angle here is not the angle of depression, okay? So if we wanted the angle of depression, we would need a horizontal, and then we would need to go down from that horizontal. This would be our angle of depression. So I'll erase this in a second, but that would be more like in the ladder, I would be looking for like this outside angle. Does that make sense? Like that outside one is not our theta. That's not what we're looking for. Okay. So just like before, I'd like us to think about how we might set this up which trig function do we want? Do we want to use sine or cosine or tangent? Okay, I like when there's more potential answers. Yeah, basically, basically. She's just like a bully in disguise. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Well, maybe if we label these, what would we know that five is the hypotenuse? What would we label two as? The opposite or the adjacent? Mm -hmm. All right. So if we have the opposite and the hypotenuse, guess which function we're going to use? We're going to use sine, right? Because sine talks about, yes, sine. We're going to use sine because it talks about opposite and hypotenuse and what that relationship is, OK? So if we set up our equation, I'm just going to write sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. And then I'm going to fill in the numbers I have. So sine of theta equals 2 over 5. OK? So how is this different from example number 1? Because like I picked a, a trig function, like I picked sine, right? So I'm still using sine or cosine or tangent. But what's making this question different than other questions we've seen? Yeah, we don't have an angle value, right? And in the last chapter, I was like, if we have this inverse sine, our answer has to be an angle. This is how we're going to use the inverse function, okay? So if you get to a point where you're like, oh, we need to find the angle, we're going to be using the inverse trig function, OK? So if you have sine, then you want to use inverse sine. If you had cosine, you would want inverse cosine. If you had tangent, you would want inverse tangent. OK, so it's just the inverse of whatever function you already have there. And so we have sine. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use that old idea of whatever we do to one side of the equation, we're also going to do to the other side of the equation. And so on both sides of the equation, we're going to do inverse sine of both sides. Okay. 
So on the left hand side, or on the right hand side is going to be inverse sine of two fifths. On the left hand side, it will be inverse sine of sine theta. Okay. Now, even though this looks like a lot of writing so far, okay, some of this we won't have to write as we kind of get the hang of what we're doing. But on the left hand side, the sign and the sign with the minus one, those undo each other. So the only thing that's left on the left hand side is theta, which is awesome because that's what we're looking for. Now, in word problems, we can take whatever we have on the right hand side and plug it into the calculator. Okay. So I'll give everyone a moment to find that inverse sign button on your calculator. While you're doing that, I'm going to type this answer in again to make sure I didn't create some weird decimals that didn't actually exist. Okay. Everybody able to find the inverse sign button on their calculator? Yes, yes. All right. So you're going to type in inverse sign, and then it should open up a parentheses, and you're just going to type in 2 divided by 5 and close it. Yes, we want to be in degrees, OK? So we're going to make sure we're in degrees for word problems. And when we're not in word problems, we're probably in radians, OK? But word problems, degrees. So when we type that in, what do we get? Yay, that's what I got too, 23.578 degrees, OK? So that's the biggest difference about this section, is that instead of saying, hey, what's the coordinate? We're like, hey, what's the angle? All right, we want to know what the angle is for any particular situation, all right? OK, so let's take a break right now. It's 10.30. Let's be back at 10.40. And let me pause this. All right, folks, welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Anybody get a refill of coffee? I think I'm still working on my first one. Ooh, a cookie, what kind of cookie? Ooh, matcha. Mm, all kinds of good snacks. Oh. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> all right. So let's jump right back into uh, what section are we on? 6.3. <laughs> Ooh. All right, there we go. Let me just double check that the recording is on. Yes, and all right. So we're gonna try something a little different here. Um, we're gonna try taking a look at just sort of like what all the things are. And then at the end of class, um, so we're gonna do, we're gonna take a look at inverse trig functions. We're gonna blast through like a bunch of practice questions, like so so many practice questions, right? Like eighteen of them. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about the theory. So we'll kind of like 
flip that a little bit. So we'll kind of talk about like, these are the rules, how do we use the rules? And then at the end, we'll kind of think about like, why these things are the way they are, okay? So that being said, let's go ahead and start with our inverse trig functions, okay? So again, we're focusing on the inverse main trig functions, which means inverse sine or inverse cosine or inverse tangent, okay? Now, you may have heard me say um, arc sine or arc cosine or arc tangent before. And that is just another way of saying inverse sine. So I could say inverse sine or I can say arc sine. I can say inverse cosine or arc cosine. I can say inverse tangent or arc tangent. They're just different ways of saying the same thing. Okay, I'm going to try and expose us to both kinds of um, ways to write it, just because you never know what a future instructor is going to do. You might want to just like be familiar with the fact that they're the same. Okay, but it's okay if you pick one and you just kind of go with that one. <clears throat> so if we look at our inverse sine or arc sine. So the way you might see it as a function is this sine with the minus one, or you might see it written out as arc sine, okay? Now, this picture below the graph, like it's, like that's it, that's the whole graph. There are no arrows at the ends of this function, okay? So if you were to do like this, that would be a big no-no. All right, that picture that we have here is literally it. That's it. It's a very small function. Okay. Now we can see that it's kind of small just by looking at the domain and the range. So our domain for this function is between negative one and one. Okay, so domain, just as a reminder, talks about the x values in a function. And if we look at the graph, the smallest x value is negative one and the largest x value is positive one. Okay, now these brackets mean that we include one and negative one in our domain. Okay, now our range, and let's pick a different color for our range, is from negative pi over two to pi over two. And we know range corresponds to the y values, so negative pi over two is the smallest y value, and pi over two is the biggest y value, okay? And so with these graphs, it's really, really, really important to think about the range. Okay, because as I mentioned earlier, up until this point, I've just said find all the angles that fit this particular coordinate. But now we need to pick one of those and we need to make sure it's the correct one. Okay, so inverse sine has a graph that looks like this. Our x values can only go from negative one to one, our y values can only go from negative pi over two to pi over two. All right. And so let's continue on. Inverse cosine, well, that one has a small range, a domain as well. The domain is from negative one to one, so negative one to one. And our range is from zero to pi over two. And so zero being like right here, and we can see that's where sort of like the bottom of the graph is, and then the top of the graph is at pi, sorry, that should say pi not pi over two. Okay. So this close-up of the graph is literally the only part that this of the graph that exists. All right. And then we take a look at inverse tangent. Now inverse tangent is different from the other two because the domain is actually from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity, which means this is the only graph where we can put arrows at the end of, in terms of the inverse function, okay? Now it too has a restricted range going from negative pi over two to pi over two, okay? But somebody tell me the difference between the inverse sine, because that one is, has the brackets, and then the inverse tangent has parentheses. 
what does that notation difference mean for us? Well, with the arrows, we can assume that there's or um, there's a lot more um, values that we can have or coordinates. And then with sign, um, there's going to be like a limit somewhere and you can't go over the limit. Mm -hmm. I think that's valid. Um, I think what I was trying to say, though, is like, why does this one have brackets? And why does this one have parentheses? Like, what does the difference between brackets and parentheses mean for us again? Ah, okay. So for the range of arc sign with the brackets, that means we include those values from the function, okay? So these brackets mean that this point up here is one comma pi over two. Like it is a point in the graph. And then this bottom point is negative one comma negative pi over two. And that is included in our picture. But what makes the inverse tangent one different is we don't actually ever get to a y value of negative pi over two or a value of pi over two. And so what we actually have here for the inverse tangent, okay, and we'll make a note of it down here. This one actually has two horizontal asymptotes, okay? So inverse tangent is not a small graph like inverse sine and inverse cosine. It actually extends forever and ever. And these, the domain, uh, I'm sorry, the horizontal asymptotes should have equations of y equals pi over two and y equals negative pi over two, okay? So are these generalizations for, of, for each function? if you're only looking at inverse tangent, so you haven't shifted it up or down, you haven't moved it anywhere, if you're only looking at the original, then yes, this is the domain and range. Yeah. And because the domain is all real numbers, if I move it side to side or up and down, that domain will still say the same, but the range might change if we move things up or down. Does that make sense, Christina? Yeah, exactly. These are the parent functions. So we could move them around. We typically don't. Um, we actually don't focus on these graphs quite as much. But yes, that's a really good way of thinking about it. Um, I have a quick question. I just didn't want to type all of it out. So sine, uh, arc sine and arc cosine, just end there, right? They don't continue, just the tangent continues. Exactly. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so maybe let's write that down, that these two um, are small graphs. So what I mean by small is there's no arrows at the ends, all right? So what you see is what you get. Um, would we say that inverse tangent is infinite? Um, we could say that the domain of it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, yeah. And if we look at quadrants, it would be like quadrants one and four for sine. What do you mean by that? Um, like if we were to have like the unit circle, it would go up to like 90 degrees for like quadrant one and then we would go down the other side for like 90 degrees, which would be quadrant four. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it means. 
Yeah. And um, Yitan, just to clarify your statement, X can only be between negative one and one. That's the domain, it's the input. So we can only put certain numbers into the arc sine function. Okay, so what I mean by that is if you type in like, I think most calculators use inverse sine. If you type in inverse sine of two, like that means X is two, is two in our domain? Well, no, because it's bigger than one. And our calculator will immediately tell you, buddy, you got, you got a number that's not in the domain. It'll tell you there's an error. Okay. All right. So to kind of tie this back <clears throat> to what we're about to do with all of our examples, the probably the most important thing here is going to be our range. Okay, so the range is the kind of numbers that come out. And this is where it tells us which one of those two angles that we came up with last week, which one of those two is actually the right answer. Okay, and it all depends on these domains. I mean ranges, whoa, okay. All right, we ready to try some examples? Kind of make sense of all these things? All right, so just to kind of let you see how this is laid out, all right? So examples three through 10 are pretty much exactly like what we did in 5.2. Okay, so a lot of these questions should look familiar, but what we're going to do is we're going to use that familiarity to help us figure out which one is the right answer. Okay. All right, so let's start with example three, the inverse sine of root three over two. Well, we know from last week that means that the y value is root three over two at a specific angle, right? And so we pull up our unit circle and we would look for where the y value is root three over two. And last week when we answered this question, I believe we said that we could do pi over three or two pi over three, right? And that was just using our unit circle. We found the y values at root of root three over two, at pi over three, and two pi over three, okay? But now, here's the added layer. This is arc sine. So I need to find an answer that is in the range. So I need an, a number that is between negative pi over two and pi over two, okay? is pi over three between negative pi over two and pi over two? Yes. Yes, right? So our answers are between those two values. Okay, well, pi over three is in between there, so that's good. But let's check the other one. Is two pi over three between negative pi over two and pi over two? No. No, it's not. Because that one's in quadrant two, but we really want to look in quadrants one and four. So this is not in the range, okay? And so if we used our calculator to type in inverse sine of root three over two, it would tell us pi over three. It would not then also say, oh, it could also be two pi over three, right? It would only give us one answer. And that's how it picked the answer, okay? Yeah, exactly, because we're looking at right triangles, which means that no one angle is gonna be larger than 90 degrees. All right, so let's keep moving. So inverse sine of negative one half. 
Well, that means the y value is negative one half at, and let's see, we said last week it was seven pi over six or 11 pi over six, right? And we got that from our unit circle, okay? Now this is arc sine. So I also need to pick a number between negative pi over two and pi over two. So is seven pi over six between negative pi over two and pi over two? No, I think no. that's third quadrant. Exactly, this is not in the range, okay? And just like Natalia said, seven pi over six is in quadrant three. So that's definitely not between negative pi over two and pi over two. Okay, what about 11 pi over six? Is that between negative pi over two and pi over two? Ah. I feel like no as well. Okay, so this is an almost. So we're gonna use orange for kind of like, you know, like an almost situation, okay? 11 pi over six is the right location. It's in quadrant four. But I need to rename that angle so that the number is between negative pi over two and pi over two, okay? So let's draw a quick picture here. My unit circle's right here. The angle is 11 pi over six. That's in the right place, but how else can I call 11 pi over six to make it a number between negative pi over two and pi over two? Yes, perfect. Okay, we can call it the negative version of that. And we count this way for negative angles and we only count negative pi, negative pi over six is another name for 11 pi over six. And so the renamed one is the correct answer. Does that make sense? So sometimes we have two answer choices and one of them is right and the other one is wrong. Sometimes, like example four, we have two answers. One of them is wrong. The other one's like almost right, okay? So the key here is we really wanna think about renaming the angle to make sure it fits within the range. All right, well, let's take a look at example five and six. All right, so again, these are same similar questions that we saw last week. So for five, I'm looking for the x value of one. And my choices last week were zero or two pi, okay? And if we think back to the range for arc cosine, or inverse cosine, that goes from zero to pi, right? So my answer can only be between zero and pi. Well, that means that two pi is definitely not right, and that zero is actually the answer for that question. All right, let's take a look at number six. So inverse cosine means the x value, and this time I'm looking for an x value of negative one. And when we looked on our, on our unit circle, we found that that was pi, okay? That was our only answer, and that is the answer, okay? Um, yes, cosine x, I'm using y to mean the output. So my answer here, 
right? What we usually think about y as an output, the output has to be between zero and pi. Yeah. Yeah, so Natalia, that's a great way of summarizing it. So cosine, when we're looking at the inverse cosine is really looking at quadrants one and two, right? Let me fill in uh, seven, eight, nine, and 10 based off of our notes from last week. And then we'll spend our time mostly picking which one is the right answer, okay? So last week we said that inverse tangent means y over x value that's simplified to root three. And we said that our choices were two pi over three or five pi over three. For example, eight, we said that the y over x value is root three over three, and we said our choices were pi over six or seven pi over six. Uh, for nine, we said that it is the y over x is undefined at pi over two, and that for number 10, the y over x was zero at zero or pi, okay? Now these are all for inverse tangent. And so inverse tangent means that my output can be as small as negative pi over two and as large as almost pi over. Okay, so again, the Y here stands for the output of what we're looking at. So based on that, take a few moments to think about which one of those are the answers or which ones you have to rename, okay? I'll give you like a minute or two to think over those and then we'll share out some thoughts. Um, I have a question real quick. For sure, what's up? Um, it says the range is negative pi over two, like it's between negative pi over two and pi over two. Does that mean that we stick to the fourth and the first quadrant when we're looking for values? Yes, that is exactly okay. what it means. Great. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Right. People need a little bit more time. Or are we ready to kind of start to go over some of these? A little more time. Okay. Let's go with maybe another minute or two and then we'll kind of check those over, okay?
All right. <clears throat> Let's take a look at example number seven here. So we have two possible answers, two pi over three or five pi over three. So what do we think? Are any one of these like automatically our answer or do we have to do a little bit of work? Okay, so tell me why you eliminated the two pi over three. Um, so I just, I looked, I think, let's see if I remember how I did this. Um, I just looked in the, in the, um, the fourth and the first quadrants mm -hmm. and I looked which one was there out of the two <laughs> and five pi over three is in the fourth quadrant. So yeah, well, but it probably has to be <laughs> Yeah, we can definitely eliminate the two pi over three, okay? Because that one is in quadrant two, that's a no-go for us. Um, but I would say that five pi over three would be like the almost correct answer, right? Because five pi over three as a number, here, let's turn that into a decibel for a moment, five pi over three. If I turn that into a decimal, I get 5.236. Okay, so all I did was type five pi divided by three into the calculator. But if I think about what pi, negative pi over two and pi over two are, this one is negative 1.57 and this is positive 1.57, okay? So I think everyone in this room would say that five point something is definitely not a number between negative 1.57 and positive 1.57 right like five cannot be between those two numbers and so this is a case where we're going to have to rename it to give us a value that is between negative 1.57 and positive 1.57 right so if we think about where this is on our unit circle, five pi over three is like down here. Another way to say that is to go negative five or negative pi over three, okay? So negative pi over three would be our actual answer. This one is like an almost, okay, All right? All right, what about example eight? What do we think? Which one can we eliminate? The pi over six or the seven pi over six? Yeah, that's seven pi over six. Goodbye, we don't need that one because that one is in quadrant three, which is not where our ranges, right? So this one is not in the range. Now, as it's written, pi over six, is that a number between negative pi over two and pi over two, right? And if you're not sure, you could turn it into a decimal and just see is that number between those two decimals we have below. And it turns out that that is about 0.5, so that is definitely in my range and I don't need to worry about renaming it, okay? All right, so example nine, we're looking at where it's undefined. We only have one answer. This is our answer. Now, some of you might be saying that's technically not in our range, right? Because our range doesn't equal pi over two, it's like almost pi over two. But when we look at things that are undefined, it's okay for our answer to be just outside of that range because that's what it means when we're saying undefined. And then for our last one here, we're looking for the values of zero or pi. And I think we can eliminate, I think we can eliminate that pi because we know that one's not between negative pi over two and pi over two. And we can take zero because zero is a number 
between negative 1.57 and positive 1.57. Yeah, exactly. If we think about it as a triangle, yeah, it would just be like two sides that were like on the same line. Yeah. Okay. So one thing you'll see on our quiz is there's going to be a lot of questions like this, okay, where we're looking for angles. We still want to use what we know about angles to find them. But now the added layer is which one's not in the range and do I have to rename it? Okay, so those are kind of the two important takeaways from these questions, all right? Now, if you're hoping that I'm not gonna ask you questions about renaming these on a test, keep hoping. All right, that is an important piece. I want us to make sure we understand when we need to rename and how to rename, all right? Number seven, for sure. Okay, so for number seven, right? So we picked, um, we picked the five pi over three, but five pi over three is like the correct location, but the wrong name. And so instead of five pi over three, we thought, okay, we could go in that direction, negative pi over three. Like negative pi over three is the same as five pi over three, location-wide. But the good thing about this one is that number is in between those two numbers. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so it's important that we know how to find these inverse functions, um, but sometimes they look like this, right? So like in example 11 through 14. Now with these questions, what's different about them is they're sort of like two layers in one question. Okay, so the first layer is I have sort of the inside part. So like, for example, 11, that would be like sine of five pi over six. The inside part for number 13 would be cosine of two pi over three, right? And then all of these questions also have an outside part. So like the outside part for 11 is the inverse sine. And the outside part for number 12 is inverse cosine, okay? So with these questions, um, really what we're doing is we're practicing going, using our unit circle in both directions, both find a coordinate and find an angle together in the same question, okay? So let's take a look at example 11. Okay, so if I'm looking for this, the way I'm going to go about this is I'm going to work on just the inside part first, just that part. Okay, so I'm going to write down the outside part because I'm not doing anything with that yet. And I'm going to use what I know about the unit circle to find sine of 5 pi over 6. All right, so according to our unit circle, what is sine of 5 pi over 6? Perfect, one half, right? So inverse sine of one half. So the yellow part, we were able to rewrite as one half, okay? But now look at our question, inverse sine of one half. Well, this looks exactly like questions three through 10, right? So now we have to see which angles have a y value of one half, and I think we'll find that as pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. Which one can we eliminate here? Perfect. This one is in quadrant 2. So that's definitely wrong. 
now we just have to double check is pi over six a number between negative pi over two and pi over two like do i have to rename it In this one it turns out we do not have to rename mm, no because if we were doing that you thought our answer would be five pi over six but it's not. Five pi over six would be the wrong answer. Wait, what part are you trying to rename? I'm, I'm saying it's like the sine inverse cancels the sine, so we have five pi over six, and then we can just rename it like we did in the last one where five pi over six is in quadrant two and the reference angle or whatever would be pi over six. So we didn't really have to go through the, the whole step of sine inverse of one half because sine five pi over six is one half, right? But you did though. You did do that. I think what, so let me write what I don't want to see, right? So if you do this, okay. A lot of people think, okay, I just can cross out the sine and the inverse sine and so my answer is five pi over six. If that's what you do, you're gonna get the wrong answer. Oh yeah, no. So yeah. we do this step and then we're like, okay, five pi over six is in quadrant two. And then, so we'll have to do the renaming step. Yeah, but. Yeah, that's a valid alternate method. If that's okay. okay. Yeah, so if you want to do that, where you're like, all right, this is my angle, but let me check if I have to rename it or not, that's totally fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you got it. Okay, let's take a look at... Let's take a look at number 12. Okay, so would people like to see it sort of the same way that I did it, or would we like to think about what Ethan's talking about? No preference. Should we show both ways and then we could kind of decide? Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. So when I'm looking at number 12, I'm going to kind of highlight the inside part again. And so if I think about what cosine of 5 pi over 6 is, then I would get that it is negative root three over two, okay? And so that's just by using my unit circle. So now the question is, well, let's find out which angle has the X value of negative root three over two. And we would get five pi over six, or we would get seven pi over six. And then we would say, okay, this is inverse cosine. That means quadrants one and two, which eliminates this one because seven pi over six is not in quadrant one or quadrant two. Now, five pi over six is in quadrant two, and so I don't need to rename it. Like, it's already in the right place with the right name. So if we think about Ethan's method, right? So he's kind of doing the same idea, I think, but just not writing down the steps. So he's saying he's got this inverse cosine of cosine of five pi over six. And based on the definition of inverses, these two cancel out, but which would give us five pi over six, okay? But the question that he needs to ask himself, which you also need to ask yourself, is do I need to rename this or not, right? 
So in example 11, we did have to rename phi pi over six as its reference angle, pi over six. In this question, he doesn't have to rename it at all because it happens to already be in the right place. So he can say that five pi over six is his answer. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that it's, it's a fine line between wanting the easiest method and making sure that folks understand how we get from one part to the other, okay? All right. Let's take a moment, maybe like three or four minutes, and have you work on example 13 and 14, okay? So take a few moments, work on 13 and 14 with whichever method you might prefer. So let me make this a little bit smaller so we can kind of see both of them, okay? Um, but let's work on 13 and 14, and then we'll share out some answers and see what we get. All right, how are we doing out there? Are we ready to start sharing some thoughts or would we like a little bit more time?
So let's take a look at number 13, okay? So if we do it sort of the method we had used before and we sort of took it piece by piece, then we should be able to replace cosine of two pi over three with a negative one half, okay? And so now we need to find out where on the unit circle, like what angle has a y value of negative one half. And so if we look at our unit circle, we'll find that it's at seven pi over six or 11 pi over six, okay? Now, I think we've done a, actually a really good job of summarizing this so far where sign we're picking from quadrants one and quadrant four, okay? And so what that means is we can eliminate seven pi over six because that's in quadrant three. It's not even in the right location, okay? But before we get too excited and we circle 11 pi over six as our final answer, we have to ask ourselves, is 11 pi over 6 between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2? Okay. And so it turns out that this is a case where we're going to need to rename our angle. Um, and anybody get what we rename it to be? Negative pi over 6. So perfect negative pi over six is our correct, correct answer. So nice, okay? So if you think about it, our 11 pi over six is like right here. This is 11 pi over six, but another name for it is negative pi over six, okay? All right, let's take a look at example 14 here. All right, so we're gonna find the tangent of seven pi over four. <clears throat> that should give us negative one, okay? And then we're looking for the angle that has an X value of negative one. And because it's inverse cosine, we wanna look in quadrants one and quadrant two. Now, luckily, this one only has one answer of pi, and pi is in the second quadrant right at the boundary, so that's our answer. Okay? So combining stuff that we knew from last week with some of the stuff that we have learned this week, how do we know when the value is in the right spot but the wrong name? Okay. So let me actually do number 13 with degrees, just so we could kind of think about it. I think the numbers are easier to think about, okay? So if I asked us to do number 13 in degrees, then you would tell me that the angle that has a Y value of negative one half is 182, 10, or the 330, right? But because we're looking at inverse sine, our answers can only be between negative 90 and 90. So is 210 between negative 90 and 90? Sure isn't, right? Now, 300, if we think about, or 330 is right here. So negative 90 would be down here, positive 90 would be right here. So 330 is in the right place in that it's sort of like on that right half of the unit circle, but it's too big. Like 330 is bigger than 90 degrees. So we sort of subtract 360, Think about how we found our reference angles. We, we subtract 360, what do we get? So 330 minus 360 gives me negative 30 degrees. So that's how I can rename it because negative 30 is between negative 90 and 90. 
but 330 was way too big. 330 was way bigger than 90 degrees. Is that a good wow or a bad wow? <laughs> okay. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. I think this is actually like the hardest part. Like, how do you know when to rename things? Okay. And then layer on top of that, we're working with pies and it's just a little bit weirder for our brains to think about. Okay. All right, so in these four questions, we were looking at the inverse sign on the outside, right? So inverse trig functions on the outside, sort of as the second step that we needed to do. And um, just to kind of bring it back to Yuthan's method from earlier, I think maybe we want to clarify that that method really only works when we have like sine and inverse sine or like cosine and inverse cosine, or tangent and inverse tangent, right? Because we can't necessarily just cross things out, for example, 13 and 14, because we mixed and matched the function, okay? So I think that's a very clever shortcut, um, and we just wanna be careful about when we use it and are we renaming our answers appropriately, okay? All right, so now let's take a look at examples 15 through 18. Okay, so in looking at examples 15 through 18, all right, what's different about these questions from 11 through 14? Would you please repeat your question again? For sure. Um, my question was, what makes these questions different from 11 through 14? Well, we got some numbers, yeah, okay. But what else is different between like the first few four that we did and like these next four that we're about to do? Oh, we're starting with the inverse first. I, it is number 16. No, we're starting with the is inverse the negative side. Number. Exactly. That inverse part comes first, right? So Brian, you got it. That inverse is on the inside. Yep, we have some actual numbers and Edward's observation is also super important. These fractions that we have are not on the unit circle, okay? So they're not like our nice angles. So for all of those reasons, even though these questions at first glance might look very similar to the ones we just did, what we really want to think about is a new strategy that's going to help us solve when the inverse part is first, okay? Before we do that, I want to bring your attention to this. Evaluate without a calculator. I've gotten some very strange answers on exams when people are using their calculator. So I would not use a calculator to necessarily solve these questions, okay? So I wouldn't just like type what we have here into the calculator and kind of hope that your answer is gonna be right, right? I really want us to understand like what we're using all the different parts of the unit circle for. And so kind of like the last set of questions, we're gonna approach the inside part first, okay? Only this time, instead of replacing it with a value, what we're gonna do is draw a right triangle that has those characteristics, okay? Now this time I have inverse cosine of three over five. How can I label my triangle so that it represents an inverse cosine of three over five? Okay. 
Like another way to think about it is what's the three represent on the triangle? What's the five represent on the triangle? Adjacent over hypotenuse. That is exactly what it is. All right, so let's, let's write that out. Because we have inverse cosine, the top number is the adjacent, the bottom number is our hypotenuse. So guess what I'm gonna do on my right triangle? I'm gonna label the adjacent side as three and the hypotenuse as five, okay? Now, if I wanted us to find the sign of that angle. How would I find the sign of this angle if I just had the picture? Because we've seen these kinds of problems before. They give you a triangle, I give you like some of the sides, but not all of it. And then I ask you to find the trig function. Mm, okay, it is the three, four, five triangle, right? And so we could put a four right there. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't recognize that it was a three, four, five triangle, we could have used Pythagorean theorem to find that missing side as well. Okay. Okay, so now how do we find sine of theta? Opposite over hypotenuse, you got it. Opposite over hypotenuse. Good thing David knew that was a four, five, three, four, five triangle. There we go. That's your answer. Okay. So if we think about this kind of in steps, we're gonna take the yellow part, sort of the inside part, and we're gonna draw a right triangle. Okay, now if it's a special right triangle, you know what that missing side is, fill it in. You're probably going to need it. If you don't know what the missing side is, use Pythagorean theorem to find it. Okay, but once you have all three sides, then you're looking for whatever ratio they ask you for on the outside. Okay, so because sine is opposite over hypotenuse, we could put it in as four over five. Okay. All right, let's try that with example 16. So we're gonna start with the inside part first again. All right, we're gonna draw a little triangle. All right, and how do we label our triangle this time? Opposite over hypotenuse. Yeah, 12 is that opposite. 13 is the hypotenuse. Okay, so 13 and 12, yeah. How do we find that missing side? Is it a special right triangle? Is it one of those Pythagorean th triples or should we use Pythagorean theorem? What are we thinking? Mm, this is a uh, Pythagorean triple, 5, 12, 13. But again, if you didn't recognize that, you could always do x squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. And when you solve for x, you should get 5, okay? So now if we think about what this one is asking us for, we want tangent of theta for the given low triangle, okay? 
And so tangent of theta means we want opposite over adjacent, which will be 12 over 5. Okay. So it's very much like a puzzle where we're pulling together all the stuff we learned in the first unit, which for some of you might be a refreshing difference that like, we don't just kind of stop one topic and then move on to the next one and it's totally different. It actually like does connect. Um, but I think that can also be really hard for some of us because if you didn't get the first part, then the second part makes it harder. But I challenge you to think about it more like an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to go back and make sure you understand the stuff from before so that you can continue to access what's coming next, okay? And so this outside part is that opposite over adjacent. Now, question for you, did we find how big the angle is at any point in this process? Like how big is theta in example 15? Or how big is theta in example 16? No clue, right? These questions, you don't actually have to find the angle. Okay, so that's why we can do them without a calculator. We don't actually need the angle in order to find our answer. All right. All right. Let's take a look at these last two examples here. Example 17 and 18. Okay. Now I'll tell you before we begin that this is gonna be, we're gonna follow the exact same process we did with 15 and 16, same process. But sometimes people get nervous because there's like variables in there, okay? There's like an X in the question. At the end, our answer will still have an X and it will be okay, all right? So we're gonna follow the same process our answer is going to have an X in it, and we're just going to roll with it, all right? So same thing, we're going to take a look at the inside parts of both 17 and 18, and we're going to draw a triangle. All right. So I think we know that sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I can put the X here and the 10 here, okay? So it's a little different than 16 because I can't put a number, like I can't put like a five there, but I can put an X instead of that 12, okay? How do I find the length of the missing side in 17 though. Any ideas? on how we find that missing side. Ah, well, cosine of 90. Which one is the adjacent side though? That's the tricky part about cosine of 90, right? Because it could be X or it could be the side that we're looking for. And Christina, you bring up a really good point. Is it a special triangle? Well, we don't know, right? We don't know. But our fallback is the Pythagorean theorem, right? We can always fall back on that Pythagorean theorem so if this is the side that I'm looking for, I can say that that question mark squared plus x squared equals 10 squared. 
Okay. Now I want to get the question mark. Like I want to know how long that side is in comparison to the other two sides. So even though I don't know what X is, I can subtract it to the other side. So 100 minus X squared. And then how do I get the question mark? Like I don't want question mark squared. I just want the question mark. So how do I get that? It can't be anything bigger than 10, right? Or, yeah, or actually, because 10, or 100 is kind of like, I guess the max, and then X can be like, um, 99 equals 81. Uh, I mean, it might be, but X could also be like 5 or X could be 6. Something, something that's like smaller than 10. Uh, right? It could be a lot of things. That's sort of the point is we don't really know. But I think, Edward, you're onto the right path here that to get rid of a square, well, we know we just take the square root, right? So if I take the square root, then I end up with the square root of 100 minus x squared, okay? Now, Edward, not to put you on the spot, but I'm so glad that you gave that answer because that's actually the number run one incorrect answer. Like this part is all fine and good, but that does not simplify to 10 minus x. Okay, and the reason being when we have a minus sign or a plus sign that connects those two, we can't just square root each part separately. Okay, so what that means then, as weird as this is, the question mark, like the adjacent side, is really just the square root of 100 minus x squared. And that's as far as we can go given the numbers that we have. Like we can't find a number for the adjacent side because X could be any number of, of things, okay? But we can still answer the question. We can still say, oh, the outside wants us to find the cosine which means we want the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? That's the definition of cosine. What's our adjacent side? Well, square root of 100 minus x squared looks gross, but that's what it is. And my hypotenuse is just 10. And that is as far as we can sort of simplify this particular answer, okay? Yeah, exactly. So guess and check is, I mean, the reason why we can't have numbers bigger than 10 or smaller than negative 10 is that's gonna make us have like the hypotenuse be not the longest side and that's not okay, right? So really what we're trying to do is think about the same procedure we used for 16, but just saying, hey, we're comfortable with some variables. We're just gonna leave it like that. I don't know what X is, but that's the relationship and we're just gonna leave it like that, okay? So less scary. Yeah, I think you mean less scary. <laughs> All right. So let's do this. Let's take a few moments. I'll give you to set up number 18, all right? At least draw that triangle. Don't be scared to draw that triangle, all right? At least draw that triangle, label it with what you can, and then let's think about how to move forward.
All right. How do we think we can label this right triangle? Let's start with that part. How can we label this right triangle? Four X is the opposite, I buy that. Perfect, that adjacent side is one. How did you know that? Because this just says four X, it doesn't give you the one. Like this is one though, how'd you get that? Perfect, great explanation. So for x, the easiest way to make anything into a fraction, put that ish over 1, right? You got 4x over 1, it's a fraction. And you've got your opposite side, you've got your adjacent side. I don't know if this is a special right triangle or not, but I do know I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find that missing side. So in this case, I'm going to have 1 squared plus 4x squared equals question mark squared. Right? And you could give it a different variable if you want. You don't have to use question mark. Okay? But in this case, 1 squared becomes 1. But what does 4x squared become? Sixteen. Yeah, I gotta square that four and I have to square the X. <laughs> All right, last step, we're gonna use Edward's thought from the last one, which is gotta get rid of that square. And so we're gonna get that the hypotenuse is the square root of one plus 16 X squared which is not equal to 1 plus 4x, right? We don't want to make that mistake because of that minus sign there. And so now, let's see, this is asking us now for the sign or opposite over hypotenuse. And let's see, when we do opposite over hypotenuse, we get 4x over square root of 1 plus 16x squared. And that is totally fine to leave as an answer. Oh no, did you make that mistake again? <laughs> it's a tough one to, to break that habit, but we'll try and make it pretty explicit, okay? All right, so how are we feeling out there? Let's kind of zoom out so we could get all four of these questions on one page. Uh, yeah, 4x is the opposite. Mm -hmm. Right, because our theta is in like that bottom left-hand corner. All right, what kind of questions are coming up for folks about these last four examples that we did? You said we didn't have to worry about uh, reciprocal functions? Uh, but like, like Cussie Kent and, um, right. yeah, we're not going to do any examples with Cussie Kent, like inverses okay. of reciprocals. No, I really, literally all I wanted you to know was that they exist. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, I tried to focus today's lesson a lot on the examples. Um, and what I saved for the last part was sort of the theory. Okay, because and I'll tell you how this is important in the grand scheme of things. I think the number one thing that I want us to take away from this section is I want us to be able to do things like the example. Okay, so that's where we want to make sure our procedures are solid, that we know what, what to use when. Okay, 
Like, do we draw a triangle? Or do we use the unit circle? Or do we need to rename things or not? Like, those are the things I really want you to focus your discussions on, okay? What I'll save for a separate video, all right, is like this page right here, I was like, here you go. These are things that are true. Just believe me, right? So if you're sitting there being like, why are these graphs so small? Why do they look like this? That's that last part, the theory part. And like I said, I'll do a video that sort of talks through where these graphs come from, why the domain is this way, why the range is this way. But if you're like, listen, those examples were hard enough for me, that's what I got brain space for, then that's where you are. If you're like, oh, that was pretty cool and I actually would like to know where all the other things come from, watch that other video, okay? Does that make sense to folks? Anybody checked out already? Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna break a little bit early today. I'm gonna stop this recording.